everyone, my name is Emma Wilson and I'm the Commissioner of Spiritual Life here at BCHS. We are so excited that you all are here with us today and I am excited to have the opportunity to share a message with you that comes from Romans chapter 12. Now before we dive too much into this verse here, I want to um, get, get into some of the context that surrounds Romans chapter 12. Here at BCHS, we find it really important that our students not only know God, but they also learn how to speak to Him and interpret His Word. BCHS has helped me in many ways to know when I'm getting too far into sin or just getting too close to it in general. Um, first of all, it's helped strengthen my relationship with God so that when I am finding myself falling into sin or falling into temptation that I'm able to recognize that. I'm able to kind of take my thoughts captive and to understand that I need to go to God for strength and to forgive me of just what I've done or what I've been thinking. The chapels on Thursdays and being close to God really helps me recognize like I'm straying a little bit too far from the path and get back on track. One uh, specific thing that, I've, that I remember learning is that God is willing to wait for you. He's not, he doesn't want to rush you along your path with Him. He doesn't, He isn't mad at you for taking too long. He loves us all no matter how far along in our walk with God we are, and He's going to wait as long as He can for you. Okay, so diving a little bit into Romans chapter 12. Romans is the sixth book in the New Testament. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. So at this point in the story, Jesus has come to earth. He has walked. He has served. He has been delivered up to be crucified, and he has risen again from the dead. And before he ascends into heaven at the end of of Matthew chapter 28, he gives the disciples this instruction and he tells them, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I will be with you always until the end of the age. So the disciples have received this command from Jesus. He ascends into heaven and now we find ourselves at the beginning of Acts chapter one. And in the, at the beginning of Acts, we see Pentecost and Pentecost occurs and the disciples are now equipped with every tool that they need to go out into the nation and serve the people of God and bring God's message to everyone. But they realize this is a really big goal and they, they're really gonna need some help if they are gonna make this possible. So they enlist the help of a guy named Stephen who are we are introduced to in Acts chapter six. And the Bible describes Stephen as a man who is full of grace and power, fueled by the Spirit of God. We see Stephen serve for about one year, and then in Acts chapter 7, we see him get stoned, and this was all approved by a guy named Saul. Fast forward another two chapters, we see God come and wreck Saul's world, and Saul actually begins his own ministry. In, uh, in Acts chapter 13, Saul becomes Paul. Then we get to all the way to Romans chapter 1, and now Paul is giving this message. It is a letter to the people and the church in Rome about being renewed and being given new life. So the beginning part of Romans talks about becoming a slave to righteousness, be being dead in sin, but being alive in God and being alive with the Spirit of God in this big mess, overall message that there is salvation for all who believe in Him. So Saul, there's probably not a better person to share a story of repentance and of witnessing the exact grace of God. So now that we have some context, let's get directly into Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, which says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by, the test, by, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. So this is probably a verse that many of, you, many of you have heard before, but I kind of wanted to take on the challenge of giving you guys a new way to think about this verse and really dive into what does it mean to conform to the world? And I myself had a, a little bit of an issue trying to put into words what it means to, com to conform to the world, 
but I really just took this uh, took a moment after I was given the directive to do this specific verse and I really just said Lord please just open my eyes to something that means that we are conforming to the world and actually my Bible reading for that night came out of Mark chapter 13 and in Mark chapter 13, the disciples are asking Jesus while he's still in his ministry about what it's going to look like after he ascends. When is he going to come back again? And Jesus says, tells them that even the angels in heaven don't even know when he's coming back. But he does give them one directive. And he says, and I, what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Stay awake and be persistent in learning and sharing about me. So what I've really pulled out from this is that to conform to the world is to fall asleep of the call of God on your life. It's to fall asleep in your obedience to God. It is to be, it is to be so in line with a divided world that you neglect the perfect unity of a God that is chasing after you and we fail to recognize it. So that is what it means. To be conformed to the world is to, be, is to be unaware and to fall asleep of the call of God on your life. Make that step. Reach out to somebody. Call pastors, call people you know that you trust and say, hey, I'm, I don't sit right with who I am and I want to drive closer to the edge. I want to have, or farther from the edge, excuse me. I want to have more I want to live my life closer to Christ. I know what is right and so that because I know I think there's a burden on me or a, a calling to do what is right and to show people what is right through my actions. Um, and I think that when you knowingly sin and knowingly do what is wrong that it, there's a kind of a, not a good feeling inside you because you know what you should be doing and I think that that's why it encourages me is because I know what is right and wrong. So that's the first part of Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And so then we see the good news of this verse is that we don't have to stay conformed to the world because God, our God is a transformative God and He has the power to renew our minds and renew our spirits. It says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So first of all, let's pull it back to Paul. He is a walking testimony of the grace of God and of the power of renewal. And the biggest part of this news is that we can be too. We can be part of this renewal. And this renewal and this, trans and this transformation in our lives, it really takes, uh, takes form in the idea of humble repentance before God. We have conformed to the world. We have fallen asleep to the call of God on our life. And now it's time to wake up and be renewed by the grace of God. And it's really all about this mentality that He is far greater than we could ever be. That He is greater than I. And it is by His, only by His grace that we are saved. Romans chapter 3 verses 23 and 24 tell us that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So basically, apart from God, we are absolutely nothing. But when we walk with grace and humble repentance and let God work His transformative power in our life, we can be renewed. And we can be so filled with joy because the call of God is on our life and we are awake to this call. Coming to BCHS, you're just exposed to amazing people with great backgrounds, with great knowledge of God, great knowledge of Christianity. They know, they know almost all questions that you may have for it. And it's just, um, it's great to have that. And you see that, you see those great examples. And it, for me at least, it made me want to be more like that, more Christian, like more holy, more wanting to be like God, more wanting to be like Jesus Christ. I really think that just being a part of a community and knowing that within this community there is safety and so um, really just showing how no matter what you do whether it is sports or it is fine arts you know you can really show the love of God to people in the audience. So the last part of this verse really dives into the so that and the so that says 
that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. So we really just um, juggle with this idea of renewal. And I love how Paul sums it up at the end of Romans chapter 12. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but be over, but uh, overcome evil with good. And there's so many ways that we can do that. Specifically, I love the way that w- we transition from do not conform to this world into the way in verse 3, um, Paul specifically talks about the graces and the gifts of grace that only come from God. So here at BCHS, we understand that God, our God is a God of grace. He's a God of transformation. He transforms hearts. And part of him doing that is that we all need to work together. So your role may look a little bit different wherever you're at. For some people, filling out, fulfilling the call of God on their life looks like being a teacher here at BCHS. It may look like being a doctor. It may look like being the president of the United States. But at the same time, we are all bound by the grace and the gifts of God. As a student, it's almost like I'm training for the rest of my life. If I involve God right now in my academic life and my student life, then I'm training for when I'm going to be a father, whatever job I may have or whatever career I may have. I'm training to put God into that aspect of my life. It's not a quick process. It's something that takes time. It's something that takes patience. And it's, yeah, it's just going to take a long time, so don't be discouraged if it takes you longer than you expected or um, longer than you wanted because God has a plan for you. He knows when you're going to be redone, so don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Well, I think that as a Christian, when in sports, that I'm supposed to give my best effort 24-7, whether it's I'm tired or I'm sore or even if, I guess, even if I'm at my best but just to give my best effort 24-7 and to give it my all. And not only that, it goes further that we got to give our best attitude as well, that we got to um, treat others uh, good, even though we're trying, trying to win, that we still got to have good sportsmanship with the other team and I guess still kind of build them up. Like if you see them on the ground, you pick them up as well. In freshman year, our Bible class was just talking about the timeline and how, you know, the, the Bible went through you know, these hard times and and how God pushed people through these just trials and really just like looking back on the timeline of the Bible and how it's not just a book. And then sophomore year we looked more into like scripture and just really understanding like what is this verse trying to say to me and why is it there? And then, you know, junior year we learned so much about how we can preach this to others and show how Having a godlike Christian character really affects, you know, your your worldview and and how you talk to others. And you know, now senior year, I feel like that we're really just talking about how important your worldview is and, and how to share that with others because it's so important to share um, Christian-like life and and how God can just transform you in so many ways and. I'm just so excited to learn more. We, so much so we see that living out a life for God, there are so many marks and there are so many qualities and we learn about these things within our classrooms here about what it really means to lead a life of faith and lead a life that is focused on God. And the end at Romans chapter 12 verses 9 all the way to 21 talk about the marks of a true Christian and it talks about what lo- living for Christ really and truly looks for. It says that it looks like loving with a genuine love. It looks like hating evil, honoring one another, being patient in tribulation, being constant in prayer, being hospitable to our neighbors, loving our enemies, having compassion, making peace, and leaving defeating evil up to God because He's got it all under control. So do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Do not be asleep to the call of God on your life. And the one thing that Jesus said, he will say it to all, stay awake. Thank you so much for watching this video. We are very disappointed that you couldn't be here in person with us for what would be a normal visitation day, but we're excited about the opportunity to share with with you what we can share. Here are a few students sharing their experience at BCHS. Um, 
yeah, there definitely was a realization during my visitation day that made me like realize that BCHS is a great environment, which I wish that you guys were having a visitation day because, you know, I could be a tour guide or my friends could be a tour guide. We could show you how, honestly, how awesome this campus is, how awesome the people are, everything about it. Because when I, when I came on my visitation day, I came from a public school. I knew like about three people that were going here and I did not know anything about the school or anything about the people. And I, when I came to Visitation Day, I met people, really nice people that were going to be in the same grade as me. The teachers that we walked in the classrooms were super friendly. My tour guide, friend, one of the friendliest people I've ever met. And everything about the campus, it's just a super nice campus. Everyone's nice and it's just a great environment to be around. I definitely remember my mom driving me to school and she's like, you know, we're thinking about sending you to BCHS. I was like, I have, like, all my friends are, are, you know, they're going to Independence, and I just, I, I won't, I'll be lost without them. You know, I'll miss them. I'll, I'll be going into freshman, sophomore year, and I'll miss them. And I came to Colors of Christmas, and I, I just remember everyone I meet, everyone I met had a smile on their face. There was nobody that was, like, angry and walking around and mad and or whatever. It was just all smiles. And that was something that was completely brand new uh, in my school experience is nobody didn't want to be there. Everybody wanted to be there and putting on this beautiful performance and showing everybody else what they had been working on in Colors of Christmas. It was it was really amazing. And it really solidified like, yeah, I want to go there, man. That's that's cool. Everyone's just happy. The teachers not only want to teach you the content of the class, but they also want to encourage you and build you up in Christ and just influence your life as a whole. It, they, they genuinely care about the well-being of every student and I know that there are some days I've been having a bad day and the teachers all the way up to Mr. Sabalka have been, they come after me and they ask, hey, are you doing okay? Like they genuinely want you to know, they're, they genuinely want to make sure you're doing okay. A time during my eighth grade year, you know, we were going through so much like two high schools like Liberty or BCHS, Liberty or BCHS and definitely the thing that confirmed it for me that I wanted to go to BCHS as watching a performance um, and Frank and just really seeing how the theater program just really connected and even though that they were all different characters they all loved each other and, and you could see it through them and you could see how much their passion was and I knew that you know somebody made them that passion for theater somebody helped them out through you know, this entire performance. And I want that more than anything. And so really just understanding, you know, if, if, if the theater program looks like this, I can't imagine what the rest of the school is gonna be like.